Hello, I'm Kerry Timchuk, Executive Director of the Oregon Historical Society, and it's my privilege to welcome you to our special program marking the 51st celebration of Earth Day. And what better way to do that than by marking the 50th anniversary of the passage of legislation that perhaps more than any other was responsible for gaining Oregon a national reputation for environmental innovation and leadership. I am talking, of course, about legislation formerly named the Oregon Beverage Container Act of 1971, but universally known and loved as the Bottle Bill. A half century after its passage, the Bottle Bill has undergone some modernization and changes, but it remains an iconic and historic symbol of Oregon's love of natural beauty and conservation. We are honored to have a very distinguished panel join me today as we highlight the past, present, and future of the Bottle Bill. Our panelists are Vicki Berger. Vicki represented Marion and Polk counties in the Oregon House of Representatives for 12 years and is the daughter of Richard Chambers, who was regarded as the true father of the Bottle Bill. Brent Wolf, professor at the University of Oregon School of Journalism and, Communi and Communications and a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who spent 30 years as an editor and investigative reporter for Willamette Week, the Eugene Richter Guard, and the Oregonian and who also wrote a book that I have long believed should be required reading for anyone who wants to truly understand Oregon, Fire at Eden's Gate, the biography of Tom McCall. Jules Bailey, a three-term state representative and former Multnomah County Commissioner, who now serves as Chief Stewardship Officer of the Oregon Beverage Recycling Cooperative. And Becky Volkel, who was with the Oregon Liquor Control Commission, which administers the bottle bill. So we look forward to a lively discussion and Becky, Let's start with you. Tell us about your dad and, and what led him to come up with an idea that would eventually lead to this historic groundbreaking legislation. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, I, I love telling this story because it's so Oregon. My father grew up in Salem. He's a lifelong Oregonian and he loved Oregon. And he loved to hike. He loved to whitewater raft. He loved to climb mountains. And he was, an environmentalist before anybody had ever heard of an environmentalist in that he he loved those spaces and he became incredibly disturbed in the late 60s when the whole world went to non-returnable beverage containers and he started finding them in lakes, rivers, on the beach, everywhere throughout Oregon. And he would drag them back in a sack and sometimes for miles. And he was incensed that people would be so disrespectful of our environment. Uh, and and he, he wasn't a big one to tell you what was on his mind, but clearly this was heavy on his mind when uh, one day he came home, but we have a place in Pacific City. He hiked the beach early in the morning and he came home and we were reading the newspaper, my mother and my father and I, and he just jumped up and said, well, that's the answer. That's what we should do. And my mother and I were like, Okay, what's the question? He ran to the phone and called Paul Hanneman, who was his state representative. And basically what he'd seen in the Oregonian was a little article that uh, up in British Columbia, there was legislation proposed to make all beverage containers. And in those days it was beer cans and pop bottles. There was plastic was not on the, on the plate then but it would make them all refundable. And he loved it because it was so simple. If you buy the product, if you sell the product, you are responsible for the garbage basically that is produced by this product. And as both the consumer and the seller, it's your problem, not his problem to be out picking it up for you in obscure places in beautiful Oregon. So he got with his legislator who met him if you knew my dad, he was a huge guy and, and had a certain presence. And Hanneman was there in a flash and they met in Pacific City and he said, we need this legislation in Oregon. This is a great idea. Uh, British Columbia is onto something. And it was, it was received very well uh, by his state representative and introduced. So it was my father's first work in lobbying. Uh, I was told many times, you know, oh, your father was a legislator. No, he was not. Oh, he was a lobbyist. No, he was not. But what he was professionally was a salesman. And he looked at this as a sales job. The legislature, there's 90 of them. I got to sell a 
a majority in the House and the majority in the Senate, and he literally went to work on it. And at the time of our, uh, you know, family life, uh, I was the last to leave, and he had time to devote to this, and he literally um, did enormous research. People don't understand how hard the research was pre-internet. Uh, he could tell you to the BTU how much electricity it would take to make an aluminum bottle. He corresponded extensively with can companies. He was on their blacklist. They wouldn't answer his, his letters. He'd write under my name. Uh, he was an information gatherer. So when he went to the legislature, like all good lobbyists, he had all his information in his hands. And Brent has a better view of what happened next, but uh, he put together a coalition. He got some other people fired up about it. He did fabulous work. And it was, it was a stunning piece of kind of Oregon, a special moment for Oregon when that passed because it was, it, we were first in the nation and uh, a lot of people worked very hard on it, and I think we can be very proud of it. My family certainly is proud of this. Mm -hmm. And it so wasn't I, just a few months of work, uh, Vicki, it was several years of work. Several it? years. Uh, it, I was graduated from high school, went away to college, got married, and, and you start every conversation with dad with, well, how's that bottle bill thing going? <laughs> um, because it was it, it was his effort, but it, you know the whole family knew he was just devoted to it. Um, but as Brent found, he was also very private about it and would only share some of the things that, I mean, there were insider stories going on all the time that he didn't tell us um, that he was investigated. Uh, he did casually mention one day, oh yeah, they're digging around in my finances. They're trying to find dirt on me. It was a really sophisticated effort to stop it. And no one could believe that just some individual would put this kind of work into it but that was dad's way he was all in when he was all in well brent let's th let's take the story from there and tom mccall enters the picture it takes a while but you you tell it so well so how did this come to pass well um i would tell you i, I mccall was a key player but um uh vicky's father uh absolutely was the center and it's a story that nobody knew I'll just tell very quickly. I went to go interview that uh, state rep representative, Paul Hanneman, thinking he's the quote unquote father of the bottle bill. And he basically said, get out of my office. We should be talking about, you know, Hunter Chambers. And, and I suddenly realized that there was this hidden story. And I'm, I was telling Vicki earlier, I feel really lucky to have been able to tell it. But it wouldn't have happened if Tom McCall had not been governor at the time. So for folks who might not know that much about him, he was a six foot five inch governor. He was a champion of environmentalism or conservation or ecology, whatever terms they used at that point. He had been a newspaper reporter and a television commentator and he had this amazing voice. He was born in uh, Massachusetts, but his family was based here and they still had this accent and this voice that made it as a broadcaster, he was compelling and unmistakable. He came from a political family and had an incredible ambition to become governor. Oh, and the other thing he was, he was a Republican. He was a guy who, who, who uh, uh, fought for all kinds of progressive legislation. And McCall um, had nothing to do with the introduction of this bill. But when it did get introduced, um, the state representative, Paul Hanneman, went to McCall and said, I need your support. And McCall said, I think that's a great idea. Now, McCall was still in his first term. He had had a very rough first term. He had not a lot of successes. And this bill got more and more popular. Um, the, the press caught on to it. And, but the lobbyists were able to stop it and to halt it. And uh, they came very close to actually passing it through the House, but it was Republican controlled and the bill was stopped. And they went to McCall and said, we need your help. And he said, nope, nope, I'm stepping away. I'm stepping away. Everybody was really disappointed in him. And there was a reporter named Don Jepson who worked for United Press International who, who interviewed McCall and said, you know, everybody thinks you've let them down. He says, you watch what happens. McCall went to the industry and said, you're, you're blaming people for the litter. When you guys create all this mess, you're blaming your customers. 
So we're going to create an anti-litter organization called Stop Oregon Litter and Vandalism. Some of you may remember SOLVE. And it was funded by the industry and a little bit by the state. And you got to imagine, it wasn't just the, the, the soda and beer uh, manufacturers. It was the glass companies, the metal companies, the aluminum companies, which were critical to parts of the Northwest economy. The bottlers, which were had uh, these companies and the owners had enormous funds um, and unions. It was quite a coalition, all opposed. And they all thought, this is great. Call's given up on it. He's got to run for re-election. He knows he doesn't want to run against us. He's, he, we've, we've got him iced. Well, what he did was he waited about four or five months until everybody kind of calmed down. And he realized he did have to run for re-election, but he knew that this bill was very popular. I mean, it's, it's so simple, right? You're not going to throw money in the street. So why would you throw a can or bottle that you just paid for? And you're not going to leave it there. And uh, it seems absolutely so simple. In January of 1970, to place this, the bill was first introduced in 1969. Beginning of 1970, just as he's kicking off his re-election campaign, out of the blue, after everybody thinks he has sold out, he stood up in Salem, at a Salem uh, speech and said, I am going to put a price on the head of every beer and pop, can and bottle. And he didn't say in Oregon. He said in the entire country. And that elevated things immediately. McCall was a master at, um, well, not only kind of uh, uh, absorbing other people's issues when it worked for him, but he was also a master of, of knowing how to pace and how to deliver and also how to frame a story, having been a reporter for years. And he knew how to get attention. And when he said that I'm going to champion this for the entire country and Oregon is going to be the test, uh, it was electrifying to a lot of people and, uh, and alarming to the industry. Before we had local glass and metal and, and bottle companies, companies coming in to fight it, the next legislature, it was the national operations. So um, he, he ran on it, and it was, he, he got reelected, and the bill got. Um, it, it, it sailed through, and I'll tell you really quick, part of, the problem, part of the reason was, not only was it very popular, but all of these lobbyists from out of town uh, so angered the legislators that they would come in and, and treat them like bumpkins. And at one point, when it was clear that the bill may pass and these companies were panicking, uh, one of the lobbyists started offering state senators $5,000 contrib contributions to their campaigns if they voted against. And that was big money back then. That, that could fund uh, two campaigns probably. And, um, and so uh, uh, Senator Betty Roberts, who later served on the Oregon Supreme Court, went to the floor and said, I've just been bribed and game over. And the bill passed. And um, McCall was always then recall remembered as the champion there were many, many players. And I'd like to know, you know, I, I know that McCall and uh, uh, Vicky, your father met once, but I don't know that McCall was even that aware of what he was doing behind the scenes. That it was that, they, they were different worlds and yet it all worked together in a way that can never happen, can never happen today. I, Carrie, I, I distinctly remember that how disappointed my father was and had some not particularly kind words to say about McCall when he wouldn't support in the first place, called him a double dealing politician, all kinds of things. Um, but, uh, uh, it, it, you know, McCall knew politics. My dad knew how to sell to individuals and it was a good, it was an excellent um, sort of melding of skill sets. So McCall was critical here, no question. Um, but I wouldn't say they worked together. They had a lot of common in terms of the way they were solo operators. That, and that, 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 see that, that was my impression. And, and I know you asked me about McCall, but I have to tell you, McCall commanded attention in the media, but if it wasn't for Vicky's father, there would be no ground swap, there'd be no ground operation. When I would go through the archives when I was writing this book and I would find these pages, these letters, and it, they were, 
blue paper and yellow paper and purple paper, and they were printed in all kinds of ways. And sometimes they were typed diagonally. And they were, this was how, that's how he got people's attention. Um, and he sent these vibrant letters and he got people's attention and he built a coalition, you know? I had no idea what these, what these crazy looking letters were. And in fact, they were the secret to getting the coalition that got this bill passed. And Carrie, one other point on that coalition. Uh, Don Wagner needs to be mentioned here because one of the things that my father was told was, well, you can't be a single individual, you need a, a coalition. And so the obverse, if you will, of Saul was the Oregon Environmental Council, which did not exist prior to this, in which Don Wagner and some bunch of volunteers literally went, they went to gun enthusiasts, fishing enthusiasts, every organization that had anything to do with the outdoors and put them together into a coalition called it the Oregon Environmental Council and got them to sign up for uh, the Spottle Bill. So it, it wasn't, there were a lot of people working on that brown game, Brent, and uh, Don Wagner yep. used to be mentioned here too because he was critical in, in working that whole piece um, and it was masterful. Yeah, your, your, your father knew enough to trust the people who knew how to build his coalitions. And, and it, it, was, it was happening at, on, on those levels. The legislators had been hearing from this, these coalitions for months when these big time lobbyists rolled in and tried to buy them off. And, it, and McCall dominated the public sphere, the press and all that. And um, uh, that's what did it. That's what and did it. It passed, Brent, as I recall, just overwhelmingly in the House and Senate both, so. Uh, yeah, like in the Senate, I, Senate was 22 to eight, as I recall. <clears throat> and I don't remember what it was in the House. And you know, this was a tight boat two years earlier. We couldn't get out of the House two years earlier. So it, it really transformed. Um, uh, uh, McCall set, the, he completely set the agenda around this. And uh, his opponent in the governor's race that year, Robert Straub, was a long, never wavered in his support for this bill. And here what McCall kind of stepped back and then came charging in again and completely took the issue away, commanded it. And that's how he operated. So. It was 54 to six in the house I had. Wow, there you, <laughs> there you go. And, and Vicki, when did your father pass away? Well, he died in 1974. And I'll be honest, uh, he was asked to go national. He walked away, said, no, uh, Oregon is what I love and Oregon is where I care. And he was, as he, he, he got a, he was only 50, Two, and he died of a terrible cancer and very suddenly. Um, but he was gearing up and beginning to build a coalition and you'll laugh about that, those of us who've been around Oregon enough because he did not like um, the, the big nuclear industry uh, because of the, the waste material that was being produced and he was gonna set down Trojan. That was, that was gonna be his next effort, which actually happened without him, but he was, that's what he was gearing up for when he got sick. Can I, I, I want to add one more thing? Um, uh, toward the end of uh, uh, Vicky's father's life, um, uh, I think Don Wagner was involved. Uh, they, they went to McCall and said, we have to honor this man. And Vicky, you should probably tell it better than I can. I think I probably learned it from you. He did not want the attention. No. And he did not want anybody to really know who he was. And, I'm still fascinated by that. Well, he he worked best in, in, in as a solo operator. He knew yeah. his skill set, and he never did it for any um, recognition. And he basically said, "I don't want any," which put us in a bind when Brent showed up and said, "What about this guy?" We were kind of like, <laughs> "Well," and I still have issues around how much does Dad want us to talk about this thing? But he's been gone a lot of years. And um, McCall came up with an award for him, and he actually said, oh, I'm not going to that. But his parents were still alive, and his mother and father were devastated that the governor was offering him an award, and he wasn't going uh, to accept it. So one month before he, he died, exactly to the day a month, he, there's a famous picture of him and McCall and yeah. this, this award. But he was... He, it didn't look like him to us because we knew he was very sick and he would not have gone if his parents who were really upset 
losing a son and all that was going on in our lives um, had not been just devastated that he wouldn't go uh, meet with the governor. But that's the kind of guy he was. He just said, well, that's the governor's problem. I, I don't need this award, but his parents did, so he went. They, they basically created that award for him and because uh, they wanted to honor him. And again, I don't know how many times the governor and your father had met, but you know, here, here's your dad who created this amazing thing, you know, and his comment to the press was, I am in no way qualified to accept this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Becky and Jules, let's let's bring it up to, up to date. Uh, the bottle bill over the past 50 years, it's been a tremendous success in, in keeping Oregon green and clean. Uh, Becky, the OLCC administers the bottle bill. What's, what's that mean? What, what's the OLCC's involvement? Right. Well, we um, make sure that, that everyone understands what the laws are, what the, um, you know, the rules are for stores, for consumers. We sort of keep everybody educated. I think that's our main role is educating um, the public about what um, the bottle bill is. We get, you know, questions every day from stores. Do I have to take back containers? How many? What kind? Um, we get the same kinds of questions from consumers. So uh, the bottle bill has evolved so much over the last 50 years and things have changed. And I've had people within the last couple of years say, you mean you take water bottles back now? And I'm like, yeah, and Gatorade. And, you know, it's just, you know, it's, it's changing. And, and uh, um, so it's a constant educational um, endeavor to, to make sure everybody understands what the bottle bill is. Well, those, for those of you who don't know, give us a, a quick snapshot of how the bottle bill works. Okay. So um, this might be better for Jules as the okay. industry side, but what, um, when a distributor sells containers to a store, uh, the sealed containers of beverages that are redeemable, then they charge a 10 cent deposit. Um, the store then sells those to consumers, a Safeway, a Plaid Pantry, um, to a consumer. And then those redeemable bottles, once they're empty, can be returned to a redemption center or um, to a store. So um, the consumer gets their dime back. The, uh, the, the store sells it back basically to the distributor and they get their dime back. So there's a loop of a dime traveling through the system those containers go out to customers and they're in that loop they go back to. And over the past half century, what started out as just, you know, beer and pop is now, as you said, it's bottled water, it's Gatorade. And right, right. It's everything except for um, uh, wine, distilled spirits and milk products, milk and, and uh, milk replacements so, or substitutes. So, um, that seems really straightforward that it's all of those, those, you know, beverages except for those, but there are certain container sizes that we're limited to container types, bottles and cans. Um, and, uh, you know, there's some things, again, that seem very straightforward. Milk is exempt. Well, what is milk? So that's one of the things that OLCC worked with the industry to come up with. What is milk? How are we going to define that? Because, um, some people thought, well, anything that had any milk in it should be exempt, but that just eliminated too many beverages. So um, that's the kind of thing that OLCC is always working on, is to help define and refine what the definitions are and, and sort of what the rules are around uh, container returns. Uh, Carrie, as an aside on the milk issue, at the, in the late 60s, milk jugs were returnable and they had milk bottles. Right. And there was discussion about putting it in. Well, in the legislature, that was an easy kill. Well, we can't do that to poor people who need milk. <laughs> so the answer to that was just take any milk product or anything related to milk out of the bottle bill and, and solve the problem. It was one of the things that they would throw at it to say, well, this can't work because you can't have milk, you know, be have a have a some sort of a extra money on the, the milk jug. So the milk thing has been consistent. Keep milk out of it because milk's a very special product with a special uh, use. Well, my my connection with the bottle bill first is I when I grew up in Reeseport, Oregon, I grew up the son of a grocer. My dad owned a small uh, grocery store where I would work and uh, work behind the counter as and uh, 
dealing with the bottles that started to come in was a, a challenge at, at, at times for the grocers. But over the years, the modernization has brought around our good friends at the Oregon Beverage Recycling Cooperative uh, that has taken away a lot of that, uh, that issue. So Jules, what is the OBRC and what's, what's the role it plays today? And it's completely modernized the process. Yeah, thanks, Carrie. And, and let me just start by saying thank you for putting this panel together and for the role that the Oregon Historical Society plays. You tell the good of Oregon history, you tell hard truths about Oregon history, and this is one of the great things that we get to celebrate. And, you know, Brent, uh, your book was actually required reading for me uh, in, in college. I would have read it anyway, but it was required. And, uh, and Representative Berger, I got a chance to serve with in the legislature. She's a chip off the old block. She talks about how humble her dad was, but she's also being very humble about the role that she played directly in the legislature in the modernization of the bottle bill and in the current form uh, that it plays, which I'll, I'll talk about in a second. And obviously the bottle bill can't really exist uh, without uh, the Oregon Liquor Control Commission, which has been a very competent steward and, uh, and regulator. And really, any good system requires a good referee. And, uh, and the OLCC has proven through this process that uh, what I've, I found to be true during my time in public service, which is that government works best when it's a facilitator. And uh, the OLCC has been a great facilitator. And Becky essentially wears the striped jersey on the field uh, and has a, a whistle that everybody respects. And that's been really important in making this work. So. We are, we are Oregon Beverage Recycling Cooperative. We are a, a not-for-profit cooperative of the beverage industry. So we are owned by the beverage industry to fulfill the bottle bill on behalf of distributors statewide in Oregon. And you, the, the backstory that, uh, that Vicki and Brent told is so important to understanding the modern bottle bill in Oregon, which really still is the model of a successful deposit return system nationwide. We were the first state in the nation with a deposit return system, and we're still the best state in the nation that everybody else is trying to copy. And part of that is for a couple of things that, that they talked about. When Brent talked about putting a price on the head of, of every bottle and can, the Oregon system established a refund value for this material, but it didn't establish a deposit. The deposit is actually uh, organized by private industry. Uh, Vicki talked about uh, the litter aspect of this and how it really started with litter. And that was the original goal of the bottle bill was litter, but the recycling came about uh, over time as that became more important. And really what we had was legislation that, as we like to say, was aspirational and not prescriptive. It essentially said, there's going to be a five cent bounty on all of these containers. Okay, private industry, go figure out how to make that happen. And then over time, industry self-organized into doing this. And, and for a while, it was a little bit cumbersome. You had individual distributors that would drop off beverage containers and then take those containers back uh, when they went and visited a store. So if you bought, say, a, a Fred Meyer Cola, you could only return that to Fred Meyer. Or if you bought a Safeway Cola, you could only return that to Safeway. And the original bottle bill only had beer and soda essentially within it. So you could sort of make it work that way. But as the bottle bill became bigger and more expansive and more complex, and water came in and you know, much less kombucha and all the things they didn't know existed back in 1971, it became important to start having a system that was more nimble and more modern where any product you purchased anywhere, you could take back to any other location and the distribution networks by which a distributor might say, drop off product and then pick up that same product on the back end, really were no longer the same when you started bringing in all these other products. And so in 2008, 2009, the beverage industry self-organized into this statewide cooperative called the Oregon Beverage Recycling Cooperative. And Representative Berger was part of the committee that helped pass the legislation that enabled this and that made this possible. And the OBRC, works across all the different retailers with all the different distributors so that you can return all these containers anywhere and that that, that now a dime uh, flows very smoothly. There's this, there's this concept now that's become very popular for any of the, the wonks, the policy wonks that are watching this called extended producer responsibility, right? And that's a really fancy way of saying exactly what Representative Berger said 
when she said, hey, these companies are putting these products out, they ought to be responsible for what happens to them on the back end. Well, Oregon set up what's called an EPR system long before it ever became pop popular and essentially put the onus for creating, running, managing, and funding that system on the backs of the companies that were putting this product into the field. And many of them fought it at the very beginning. And so the story here is that it has come full circle into the industry really saying, hey, this is a good thing for industry. We want really high redemption rates. We value the bottle bill. We're gonna support it. We're gonna defend it because it's not only important for litter, it's not only important for recycling, but now it's in a place where in a modern economy, it's actually important for the supply chain, for these companies to be able to get access to that recycled material to put into the bottles and cans that they're making in order to, to uh, have recycled content that's better for the environment and that uh, consumers demand. So it really has been a stewardship role that industry has embraced uh, and, has, and has stepped into. So now you can return your bottles and cans in all kinds of ways. You know, Carrie, you can return it uh, like you did back in Reed Sport, where you can take it back to grocery stores. We also own and operate the Bottle Drop Redemption Center network. We have 26 full service locations. And now over 40 of these, uh, what we call Bottle Drop Express or dealer redemption centers, where you can use the green bag program. You don't even have to feed the machines or return them to a human. You just put all your containers into a, into a bag, drop it in a drop door and get your account credited with your money. And once you do that, there's all sorts of things you can do with that money. You can spend it in store for a 20% bonus on your money if you're buying groceries. You can give it to your kid's school or to any nonprofit across the state of Oregon and oftentimes have that matched uh, by the beverage industry. Or you can even do fun things like connect it to your kid or your grandkids uh, Oregon College Savings Plan account and have every bag you drop automatically invested uh, for your kid's college future. And as we've built this system, we've begun to see all the different things that you can do with it. And the amazing part is, is uh, back in the day when this was getting started, one of the reasons that people were littering containers out the window back in uh, before 1971, before the bottle bill, was that before 1971, there, we mostly had reusable, returnable bottles. People would drink their, their beer bottle and then return it back to the brewery. And there was a deposit on them. Well, as the industry transitioned to single use containers, the deposit went away. And the slogan for many of these single use containers was no deposit, no return. It was advertised that you didn't have to pay a deposit. You didn't have to return these containers. You could just throw them out your window, it would be fine. Well, nowadays we've come full circle around. Our slogan is small deposit, big return. And we've actually used this system to now reintroduce reusable bottles back into Oregon statewide. So uh, what's old is new again, we're bringing back some of the ideas from before. And that's really the role that OBRC has tried to play in stewarding this bottle bill. And, and I've seen some figures, Jules, and I'm confident that you've got some at the tip of your tongue. The tremendous environmental uh, impact this has had in, in terms of, you know, the, the recycling and every, everything like that. You, you have some numbers for us or? Yeah, absolutely. And, and they really are staggering numbers. So uh, in, in 20, we'll, we'll throw out 2020 a little bit because it was a little bit of an anomaly with the pandemic. But in 2019, uh, nine out of 10 containers sold in the state of Oregon uh, came back in the OBRC system. It was a little bit lower when you count some of the on-premise sales and, and uh, some of the, the distributors that aren't part of OBRC. But within OBRC, it was about nine out of 10 containers sold in the state of Oregon came back. That's a pretty good number. And when you, when you look uh, at that, uh, that other one container out of 10, that 10%, if you account for containers that were uh, recycled on the curbside or lost or broken or taken out of state over to Vancouver, Washington, you're essentially looking at full redemption. That's about as many as you can hope to get back. So this year we processed nearly 2 billion containers, slightly less than 2 billion containers. That's a lot of glass, metal, and plastic uh, out there. And when we process those containers, so it all stays domestically. So people think about, oh, this material getting shipped overseas or going various places. 100% of all the glass that we take back in the state of Oregon goes right up the street uh, to the Owens, Illinois glass plant in Portland, where it is crushed and made into 
new bottles that are sold in the Oregon craft beer and craft wine uh, industry. So uh, one of the reasons they're really successful is they get access to really high quality bottles at an affordable price. Well, we provide the glass uh, for that. And a lot of those bottles are 70% or more recycled material. For all the uh, plastic, 100% of plastic. So every one of those plastic bottles, no matter where it comes back in the state of Oregon, goes to a facility in St. Helens, Oregon, uh, good uh, rural jobs at the Port of St. Helens, and is turned into the raw material for new plastic products right here in Oregon uh, at a facility that we co-own. And then all of the aluminum is recycled domestically. We don't have a smelter in Oregon to, to process it, but it's all recycled domestically. So this is all very high value uh, material uh, that's offsets tons of carbon, a lot of waste, keeps containers out of the landfill, and really fulfills that promise of clean beaches and clean rivers, but at the same time goes far beyond uh, what we thought the bottle bill could originally achieve and is really about delivering climate change benefits, which weren't really on the radar screen in 1971, as part of provided, as part of the, the supply chain uh, for these beverage containers. And not a penny of it is paid for by Oregon taxpayers. It is completely privately uh, funded through OBRC. Great story. Uh, Vicki, it must have been incredibly meaningful and, and satisfying for you as a state legislator. You know, decades after your father comes up with the idea to play a role in modernizing the bill that was his proposal. This is, yeah, I, this is my story. When I uh, ran for the legislator, legislature, there were lobbyists who knew well who I was. They don't forget. Hmm. And uh, they were kind of saddled up to me and say, oh, are you running for the legislature because of the bottle bill? Well, actually, I had a whole bunch of things on my agenda not particularly the bottle bill. Uh, I was a former school board member and I thought education was gonna be my focus. I ended up on the uh, revenue committee, which is the tax committee. And God help me, I had no idea I'd love it because it's the wonkiest thing on the planet. I loved it and spent uh, most of my 12 years of legislative service working on tax issues. But uh, as I started my third term, I got a call from in the summer when I was running and busy uh, from a reporter out of Portland who said, you know, it's the 35th year of the bottle bill. Are you going to do anything about the bottle bill? And I said, he said, we ought to make it a quarter. And I said, because if you do the math, what a nickel was worth in 1969, it's now 19 or 2006. Um, so you do the math and it's worth a quarter. And of course, Oregonians in 2006 weren't ready for a quarter deposit and I knew it. But I, I kind of hung up the phone, thought about it a little bit and said, you know, it is time we've got to get plastic in there. That was the lift because the bottle bill was only glass and aluminum and plastic. Uh, my father could not imagine Oregonians drinking water out of a plastic bottle. And uh, it was becoming a huge issue so I sent out a little press release and said, yeah, we ought to make it a quarter. And oh my gosh, the response was overwhelming. Industry was at my door. Oh, you can't do that. Legislators were at my door. Oh, you can't do that. Oh, I want to be part of it. It just, I never dreamed that so many people had such strong feeling about it. Well, I wasn't serious about the quarter, but it, it worked to get everybody kind of looking at the thing. So going into the 07 session, um, I had time to build a coalition. And I have to say another group that both my father and I had um, great support from that doesn't get credit because they didn't want to be in front of the parade, but they were important in pushing from behind. And that was some of your local distributors. They are tied to these big national companies who were fighting this tooth and nail. And some of the local Oregon distributors would saddle up. That's happened to my father and happened to me and say, I know we are technically supposed to fight this, but we're not really. And that helped a ton to not have uh, the, some local distributors walking down Main Street saying, this is going to kill my jobs, this is going to kill, because that's the kind of thing that Oregonians really listen to. And so I can't name names, nor did my father, uh, because they chose 
not to go into a public fight with the people who are nationally associated, but they're there and they were important and they need to be recognized because Oregonians do things the Oregon way and this was a classic case. So uh, in the end, uh, a coalition came together and we met frequently. All, we just brought all the players into the room. We had leadership on board. We had the governor on board and, and we worked until we could come up with a system that everybody could live with. And it passed fairly straightforwardly because it was a, it, because people really cared and people knew that the public understood we can't have these plastic bottles not be in it. And it, it didn't go to a dime right away. That was one of the big issues, but we put in there that if redemption rate went somewhere, then the uh, deposit would go up. Not deposit, Jules, sorry. What did you call it? Something else. Refund, Refund value. value. Refund value, that was it. I love the language. At any rate, uh, so eventually it did go to a dime, but just that one press release was so funny to me that it just stirred, all of a sudden it was like throwing everything up in the air and having snowballs come flying at you from all over. It was, I hit a raw nerve all over the place with some little press release. It was kind of fun. Do you, if I, if I jump in on that briefly, uh, I mean, one, I think that's an example. Leadership puts a stake in the ground, and, and that's exactly what that, that press release did. Uh, but uh, Representative Berger absolutely nailed it. And, and one is, is that uh, uh, getting plastic in it in the bottle bill was a game changer and really important to the overall health of the bottle bill, including the health of the environment. Two, the 10 cents over time really made a big difference. And, you know, the, the redemption rate prior to the change from five to 10 cents was really, and Becky can, can probably give more exact numbers, but uh, was in the, the high 50, low 60% range. And then after 10 cents jumped uh, to that high 80s, 90% range. And so the, the deposit and the refund value really made a difference in that. The system that industry has created really helped absorb that demand. It didn't necessarily create the demand, but it helped provide convenience and access for customers to be able to return those containers and and to the point about local distributors, that's that's absolutely correct. A little bit before my time uh, at OBRC, uh, you know, the following story would unfold, and I've I've heard story tell of it many times where there'd be some uh, bottle bill related legislation or topic that would come up in Oregon, and we'd get a phone call from uh, from a national representative of uh, of the beverage industry. It wasn't in Oregon. It was all right. Well, we got this we got this bottle bill thing coming up. Uh, What's, what's going on with that? Is that something we need to oppose? And, our, and the local distributors would say, no, 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 this is Oregon. In Oregon, we support the bottle bill uh, and this is what we're going to do. And that's really come full circle around to uh, the Oregon experience through local distributors and through um, uh, what's happened here has now kind of infected nationally. And as a result, uh, you know, I'm on the phone with uh, the state of Connecticut and distributors there as they seek to say, uh, what's happening in Oregon? How do we copy that in Connecticut? And you know, California, even during during COVID, flew a delegation of 20 plus legislators and industry people and others up to Oregon to look at what we're doing to see how to reform the California model. And uh, Senator Merkley is now actually the co-sponsor of the uh, Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act uh, that is uh, uh, look is looking among other things at a national. Uh, deposit return system the industry has been at the table at and uh, and discussing in good faith so from a from a small beginning in Oregon we now are actually seeing some of those national big picture changes uh, that I think Richard Chambers was uh, was asked to lead back in the day. Becky did anything to add, add to that? Um, yeah you know the uh, like Jill said the the, the, the annual refund val uh, rate was was low 60s um, and once the commissioners decided, yes, the, you know, the trigger's been, been uh, set to, um, for the statute to, to raise it to 10 cents, um, uh, the refund value went to 10 cents. And right away, the partial year in 2017, that it went to 10 cents, um, it jumped up over 10% um, annually for the year. That next January, 2018, is when most of the other beverages were added. 
and then it jumped up another 10%. So all of these changes are moving it in the right direction. It's gotten more, gotten more people um, deciding we don't wanna put our containers at curbside. We don't wanna throw them away. We wanna get them into this clean stream. Um, we wanna get our dime back. And um, uh, it's, it's just made a, a huge change. So um, we're moving totally in the right direction. And as Jewel said, um, just about 100% return rate to OBRC is just incredible. So, and, and Brent, along with probably the beach bill, uh, the bottle bill is probably the most influential thing in, in setting McCall's iconic image, wouldn't, wouldn't you say? Uh, I would say in terms of the national reputation, no question about it. As I said before, that <clears throat> decision, that speech in Salem, uh, to not just make the play for the state, but to declare this is going to be a national issue. Um, uh, it was a gamble, but, you know, McCall was a gambler uh, in real life. And he, uh, he understood that if he could succeed at that, it would give uh, not just credit to him, but also to the entire state. And he had already been moving the state and doing things to get attention, but this was, this was a primary thing. From then on, for years after that, when Oregon was talked about in the national press, McCall was written about the bottom bill was uh, was the calling card for, for Oregon. And, and Jules, look into the future. What's what's next for the bottle bill? What are some changes that uh, we can look to? Oh, we're just getting started. I mean, it's amazing how fast things have have changed even over the last few years with expansion and the deposit change. You know, one of the, the amazing things is back in 2010, which was not that long ago, 90% of all container returns went through large grocery stores and 10% went through convenience stores, mostly in very rural areas. To, bottle drop did not exist. It wasn't a thing. Well, bottle drop was created in 2010 and over time. Now today in 2021, almost 80%, around 78% of all returns in the state of Oregon go back through the bottle drop system. Uh, and about 10% go through convenience stores still and low teens, you know, 12, percent or so of returns go back through grocery stores. So we're rapidly building out the bottle drop network. Uh, hopefully people have seen green bag drop sites uh, popping up everywhere near their home. We're continuing to do that. We just uh, 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 bought land and are building a new processing hub and bottle drop in Coos Bay, Oregon. So we'll be able to serve Reed Sport with uh, green bag drop sites and all the way down to Brookings and every corner of Oregon uh, for this kind of access. And even, even from there, uh, more exciting things are happening on the horizon. We are, we're launching a pilot program uh, in uh, conjunction with the city of San Francisco. Uh, San Francisco has asked us to come down and help them uh, set up a, a bag drop program. And, and who knows, the, the state of Washington is even considering now a, a deposit return system modeled to some degree on Oregon. Maybe someday we'll have a, a system where any bottler can that you buy uh, on the West Coast is returnable to any place uh, on the West Coast. And we have a kind of a regional uh, a system in place. So there's just a lot that's out there and a lot of exciting things around the corner. And in fact, just before, uh, 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 before this panel, I was in a discussion around some of the work that our members are doing on trying to figure out how to get even more of the plastic that's in Oregon into their supply chain and into recycled content. So uh, look for really fun, big things to come. And I'm also excited that OHS, the Historical Society, is partnering with OBRC to, we're, we're uh, going to have a, a traveling exhibit uh, that we'll have later this year and be able to send to museums and libraries and city halls around the state that will tell the stories that we've been telling today. We'll tell the story of the bottle bill. That'll be a lot of fun. And, and as part of the, uh, the 50th anniversary promotion, we are going to... Uh, have a, a, a hidden bottle promotion. So there's gonna be a few commemorative bottles that uh, will be hidden around Oregon. Uh, we'll announce that when it's time, you'll be able to find that hidden bottle and you'll be able to redeem it, uh, bring it in and redeem it for some fantastic prizes. Uh, so we're gonna be uh, doing all sorts of fun things to celebrate the 50th anniversary and the partnership with the Historical Society and the OLCC and planning this out has been really inv invaluable. So, so Vicki, one of my very favorite Tom McCall quotes uh, is the one where he said that heroes are not giant statues framed against a red sky. They are individuals who say, this is my community and it's my responsibility to make it better. 
by that quote, by that standard, uh, your father was a true hero because he truly made uh, all communities in Oregon better with his uh, the idea and pushing this and making sure that it happens. So, uh, so hats off to, to your father as we remember him as, as, as a true hero. And, and Vicki, we gave you the first word, we'll give you the last word today. Well, I, I am thrilled. Uh, I'm thrilled that finally Brent found us out and got my father on, despite the fact that he didn't want to be on the, the historical radar here, he certainly is now, and uh, it's it's my family's legacy, but really it's Oregon's legacy. This wouldn't work in just any other state. It, Dad grew up here. He understood how much Oregonians care about Oregon, and he, he mined that vein very deliberately, as did Tom McCall, in order to give us this legacy. I think we can all be proud of it, and I, I agree with Jules. We have to move forward. There's no standing still here. It, it isn't one and done, it's a process. That's what the bottle bill is. And we can be proud of it and, and we need to be mindful that we have to keep working on it. I'm so glad you're there, OBRC and, and the state working on this the way my family envisioned it. Well, thank you, Vicki, and thank you, uh, the whole panel, Brent and Jules and Becky for uh, such a fascinating conversation and a great way to celebrate Earth Day. Uh, and a great way to uh, to talk about this this great Oregon innovation, this great Oregon idea that all started with one one man. Uh, what 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 a story! We hope you enjoyed this, and uh, be sure and tune in and go to www.ohs.org for other programs. Thanks a lot for watching. Thank you. Thank you all.